co-founder of The Conduit, a diverse community of people passionate about positive impact. This episode is produced in collaboration with DLA Piper and recorded at The Conduit studio at COP26 as part of a series exploring the role of the law in responding to climate change. Throughout this series, we're speaking to experts on climate justice and litigation, policy making, human rights, finance and carbon literacy to understand how business, government and the third sector can work together to speed the transition to a just and sustainable future. 135 countries representing more than three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions have committed to net zero by mid-century, but we will fall woefully short in pledges for the near term. To stay on track to 1.5 degrees warming, we need advanced economies to set more ambitious targets and introduce bolder policies much more quickly. To discuss this vital topic, I'm delighted to welcome three experts to the Conduit studio today. Robin Scott is an entrepreneur and author and co-founder and CEO of Apolitical, a global learning platform for governments used by over 100,000 public servants and policymakers around the world. First to join Robin and myself is Ida Orkin. Ida is the former Minister for the Environment in Denmark. She's a member of the Danish Parliament for the Social Democratic Party, a spokesperson for research and education, and is chairman for the Parliament, Parliament's Climate and Energy Committee. Thank you for joining us, Robin and Ida. Thank you. So Denmark has set some pretty remarkable and ambitious uh, uh, net uh, emission reduction goals, 70% by 2030. You were in the room and an architect and uh, significantly responsible for that. And I guess I'd like to zoom out as we sit here in COP and um, tell us a little bit about what it takes to get a country that is broadly inclined to do it, broad political support, but nevertheless devilishly difficult. Mm -hmm. So as a person who's actually sat in that chair, um, how did you manage to architect those commitments? Well, it's a good question because sometimes in politics you have to work when the timing is there. So sometimes you think there's a new world, everybody's talking about climate, but for real it might only be a few months where everybody's ready to make bold decisions. And we had a time in 2019 where we had all the youth on the streets, we had had this enormously warm summer where you know we saw all this crops falling apart and we had a remarkably weather that made everybody feel that this is real. We had an industry lining up behind ambitious goals in Denmark, which has been very helpful because they see it as a business opportunity. They are absolutely convinced that the future is the green economy. That's where the jobs will be. That's where the well-being of the people will be. And those who are not transitioning will be left behind. So with all of that coming together uh, and with a new government coming in with my party in the lead, uh, and with a strong coalition of parties that were very ambitious, pushing our government, thank you for that, uh, we actually managed to set ourselves a goal and get wide support in almost all of parliament. So this is something that will stay for years and years, no, no matter who's in charge. So industry really knows that they can count on this and it will not go away for those who do not like it. And, um, and we set the goal of 70% even though we don't know how to get there. Right? We, didn't have, we couldn't calculate our way fast forward things and say we'll get there by just tuning in on things. We really have to build the way there. We really have to build the steps going there. So the whole legal framework was very important to say we'll put this into law 2030. Uh, we will put into law that we have a climate co committee or a climate council monitoring us every year. So every year is an opportunity to be either proud or embarrassed uh, of the Climate Council telling us are we on the way. Uh, and we have a discussion in Parliament every year talking about how is the, this advancing. And the government has to put forward plans that are credible to say we are en route to making our goals in 2030. So it's not often that you get that confluence of political forces that enable you to do something and then set a broad horizon and then set a set of parliamentary mechanisms that report on and hold people accountable en route. There are always obstacles and vested interests, right? Vested interests may be industries that stand to lose, but then I think a much morally and economically more difficult question, which is a kind of the just transition argument of how do you make sure you take the most vulnerable, the poor, um, people who 
who could benefit but could also lose from this transition along with you, A, because it's morally right, but B, because it's politically important to bring them along with you. How did you think about that in the Danish context? It's an extremely important question, and this is why Denmark, together with the IEA, the International Energy Association, uh, and, and, other, and a few other countries, we actually made a report that came out yesterday on just transition. Getting the wording, what is actually just a transition, getting people jobs, getting more women into the energy sector, uh, helping those who are left behind, what do we do? And with a lot of concrete examples from all over the world. Talking about Denmark, we have just announced that we will stop oil extraction in the North Sea. And we have a lot of people working in that industry. So part of that deal to say we will give no more concessions was actually a promise to retrain the people working offshore. And the, the lucky thing is that we are turning the whole North Sea from extracting oil to now being a wind hub of all of Europe. So we want to build these energy islands where we can have transmitters having you know, turbines with what can make uh, electricity for millions of people. And, and we are retraining those who used to work offshore with, wind, uh, with oil to now working with wind. And we also re retraining some to work with carbon capture and storage because we can use the old oil areas to pump CO2 back and store it in the ground. So this is one way of working with it in our countries is how can we really, in the developed world, train, retrain people and, and not be left behind. So Robin, you uh, are the CEO and founder of an organization that provides information and analysis and provides cross-learning to civil servants to enable them to make more effective and interesting decisions. It seems to me that Denmark is a kind of remarkably interesting case study applicable, for example, to the United States, where one lone senator is jeopardizing a, a transition because of vested coal interests in one state and the peculiarities of the U.S. Senate. But how, how is the Danish example perceived globally and what, might a, what are the kind of lessons that apolitical would teach or extract from it? Well, first of all, I should just say back when we started Apolitical um, in 2016, we were looking for who are the, the kind of iconic public servants who give us hope and make us want to create a platform like this, because we were told there are no innovators in government, you know, no one's going to use this. And Ida was one of the people we, we turned to and we're like, we're building it for people like her. Um, I think on the, on the Danish example, one of the easy excuses that's made is, oh, well, Denmark's a small country and therefore it doesn't apply. That's trotted out all the, the time. And I, one of the things we are trying to do is in the translation of something that's working in one country to another, show that yes, not everything is transferable, but for sure there are lessons to be learned. And part of that requires not just the headlines of a policy, but actually connecting the people behind the policy so they can talk to each other. So someone like Ida can have a conversation with someone working to remove some senatorial kind of bottleneck and say, well, these are some tactics that w could be relevant to you too. And that, um, that failure to translate is one of the most costly failures in the world. M McKinsey's calculated that if governments just did what was already working elsewhere, it would save $3.5 trillion a year. And examples in the climate space abound where there are relevant learnings to be translated. So when we were talking just before we started this conversation, you were saying you had just been in a conversation with the Indonesians. And, and you know, one of the, you know, to Robin's point, small country, big country, 220 million people, 17,000 islands, absolutely vital that the forests are protected, in particular if we are to stand a chance of uh, being able to hit the net zero goals, but also incredibly important country for how it produces and uses energy. So if it's not betraying the confidence, I'd love to know the sorts of conversations you had because I think there, there's an example of kind of cross-learning. Well, it's a very interesting case because it's actually proving Robin's point that it is possible to learn from one another. Say one thing is if you want to put more renewables into your energy system, like Indonesia wants to do, they want to put in more solar, more wind, how can you actually balance a grid so you don't have blackouts? And one thing that we've helped other countries with is actually to turn coal-fired power plants up and down compared to so when the sun is shining, there's a lot of wind, you turn it down. And when there's no 
sun and wind, you turn it up. It's, it sounds easy, it's very difficult on the technical side, but we will send people with that kind of technical knowledge. We will send people who can help with financing, finding out how can you actually finance these new types that's not a coal-fired power plant. How do you get investors to be, feel safe with that kind of investment? And we are helped a lot right now because wind is so, so cheap now that it's actually cheaper to install wind and solar than to run a current existing coal-fired power plant. And you don't have to have all the air pollution. And so the, the argument of the green economy being stronger is really clear now if you look at energy prices. Um, so this is what we talk about when we talk about capacity building. Because, because look at a country like Indonesia. I remember talking to the Minister for Environment who said, yeah, well, we have this strong legislation protecting the oceans, but um, there's 18, there are 18,000 islands and we, I have four civil servants to enforce the law. So please help us build capacity. And that is to be taken very seriously in these lessons learned. Work with the countries that really want to do this. Help them show that this is where the donors go. This is where the money flows. We want to help you. I'm sure that is a strong strategy to get more developing countries to lead like Indonesia is doing. And just the last point, Indonesia can be cut up in regions in the size of Denmark. The, one of the leading regions are actually five million people in three islands, in the Bok and in, in an area where I've not, not been there, but I think they can be compared to us and they can learn from us. And, um, and so that large scale argument doesn't always hold. Robin, you've been watching COP and COP in some ways is a kind of real laboratory experience for what apolitical does. It's cross-learning in real time in a highly complicated negotiating format between governments trying to say, well, what works, what doesn't, what are the costs, what are the benefits? Um, have, have you got a sense that there's a forum or do people like apolitical, can you play a role in encouraging um, experience sharing, expertise sharing and cross-learning in these vitally important negotiations? Well, what I would say is there's a lot more appetite for what COP is trying to achieve than you might um, imagine. So we ran ahead of it, we ran a poll of our membership um, asking them about uh, whether they thought COP would be successful, which was about two on a scale of one to five. So these are public servants, these are the 200 million plus bureaucrats. But we, um, one of the very interesting results was asking public servants who didn't work on climate how important they thought it was for them to be working on climate. And again, we asked that on a scale of one to five. And the average was 3.7, which was way higher than, than we expected. So I think there is a, um, there's a, lot, a high degree of goodwill and desire to actually help um, implement some of these ambitious plans being put forward, um, or the not quite ambitious enough plans being put forward, but they're, they're bottlenecks. And the top bottleneck in the survey we ran was access to good skills and knowledge, the right skills and knowledge. So a huge opportunity there. We need to um, bust climate out of its silos. We need to look at industries like, um, like health and how healthcare benefits from tackling climate. Uh, something most people don't think of tourism. Tourism represents 200 million jobs globally, more than 10% of global GDP. We've just celebrated a, a list of the most innovative tourism org organizations globally, incorporating sustainable thinking into to their work. So uh, there is so much to be done, so much goodwill, but we need to completely rewire the system. So rewiring the system is a perfect segue to my next question, which is here at COP, I've been speaking to a lot of people about innovations, breakthrough technologies, all the sorts of things that are, could potentially accelerate or rescue. But then there's some pretty mundane, boring infrastructural things that we could do. So 40% uh, of all water is lost through leaky pipes. That's not just a humanitarian uh, nutritional health uh, disaster, it's gigatons of carbon mm -hmm. seeping away because water takes energy to produce. Our electricity grids are not built for purpose, they're inefficient, they're not smart, they're just some very simple enhancements, let alone fully-fledged AI-empowered smart grids, um, would 
dramatically reduce our peak energy requirements. So what have you know, has that been something as a, as a climate minister been on your agenda, doing the kind of boring infrastructural things that if governments do well, you just improve on, and then if you cross-share that, you achieve enormous goals without having to do the whiz-bang breakthroughs? Absolutely. Yeah. Look at the city like Copenhagen, our capital. We had huge water leakage. And just by, you know, insulating the tubes, you don't have to dig it all up. You can actually, like, pump in these uh, socks, they're called, that uh, insulate the tubes. You can monitor with, with the EC cameras where is the leakage. And you can do that also in developing countries. The problem is, in many developing countries, you don't pay for water. The water has no price, even though it actually has a value, because, as you say, it costs energy to clean it and, and distribute it. So an argument has been you have to put a price on water, which could seem counterintuitive in a developing country because everybody should have the right to water. The, the fact, the truth is people pay for water. If you don't have a well or you don't have, you will pay somebody, even in the slums in Nairobi you have, you know, gangs tra trading the water. So there is a price on water. So what we were su suggesting was simple things like put a price on water, um, a taxation of some kind, but give that money back to people. So you give it as a green check. So every family has that money to buy the water. And in that second you do that, it, can, it, it actually pays off to do these simple, simple things that you can retrofit in already existing urban areas. And I think for policymakers, also us who are elected, we have to go into those details. And that's the problem with climate. It's by far the most technical, difficult area in the parliament. And I've been in it for 20 years. And I know how difficult it is for others to see the, the details. I think it's also why we see extinction rebellions or young people getting very frustrated of the, the speed at which things are going. It's because it's hard to understand how locked in we are in all ways of doing things and how change has to be very, very in detail, smart and well thought out in order to not make bigger problems for ourselves. So I'm going to give Robin the final word, but I want to ask you one even geekier question, um, and that is about uh, carbon trading and emissions. And in particular, <clears throat> for those people listening in, we won't get to net zero unless we pump up our capacity to draw down carbon and unless we, we begin to count our capacity to draw existing carbon out of the atmosphere. And there is a, a very good argument exactly analogous to your putting a price on water, to putting a price on carbon, and to start giving credits for projects that draw down. Um, but it's mind-numbingly complicated to design these systems, and there are you know, math PhDs who are trying to figure it all out. How do you, as an elected official and a politician, make this something that ordinary people can understand and should care about because it is of civilizational consequence. If we don't get it mm. right, we we're, we're, we're lose. The easiest thing to explain is carbon tax because you tell people right now there's a lot of pollution that nobody's paying for. You're actually uh, sending pollution to somebody else when companies do not pay for it. So if you put a tax on pollution, the polluter pays, uh, you can actually make sure that the greener products are the cheaper. I think that's maybe I didn't put it the most perfect way. I'm sure the communication people can help me. But understanding if you want a fair market, you should pay for your own pollution. And the second you do that, the cheapest product is also the, the cleanest. If it's more geeky is the European quota system where we actually have a cap and trade system. And it took us 20 years, I think, something like that to get it right. But now it's up to maybe even 80 uh, euro dollars a ton. And once you start getting there, then it, if you have a technology who can draw out one ton of carbon, that's cheaper than that. So the second you have a price on carbon that's high and somebody who has a technology that's cheaper than that, you will have a really speeding up of people taking carbon out of all kinds of processes or even direct air capture. So I'm very hopeful of us going there. So that's why we have to create these carbon markets, even though sometimes they're, they're really bad because they they can also incentivize people to just keep polluting and paying somebody else to do something that we are not absolutely sure is decarbonizing. So, so Robin, you've been um, an observer of COP and you also, through the work of Apolitical, 
watch civil servants and governments all the time and how they perform and behave and clearly a political's entire raison d'etre is to try and make them better and more effective. What's been your takeaways from watching this COP process this time around up, up close? Well, back to that, that survey data I, I mentioned, I think it has gone better than it could have gone. And I think if many people I've spoken to have been pleasantly surprised by, by some of the progress. I think there, it's been more inclusive to voices that haven't necessarily been included in previous uh, meetings, uh, more young people, more indigenous people, and that's really important. Um, and I think there's, there's more of a sense of urgency that everyone feels. And that's really interesting amongst our public service network now. There's a sense of ownership of the problem writ large across government. It's no longer just a particular department's problem. So it's not enough, but for that reason, I am super optimistic compared to you know, where I was six months ago, because I think people will, the change will, will happen fast now because you've got that individual will behind it. I'm going to spring a final question to both of you. I can't resist um, lightning round, but it seems though that the level, number of CEOs here have been far larger than anybody else. Business is showing up for bad reasons, good reasons, deep reasons, cynical reasons. Um, and I, I guess, I guess uh, I'd like you to kind of just reflect a little bit. You know, chief sustainability officers are now reporting into CEOs. They can get the attention of people straight away. Um, and business seems to be playing a more vital role. They're not being dragged along. They realize it's, it's central to it. And as they engage with government, there's both risks and opportunities. And I'd like you both to think about the risks and opportunities of business being far more assertive in the climate space than it's ever been before. From my perspective, risk is, of course, greenwashing. But there are companies that can make it look like they're very green. Uh, I have no problem outing a company like Shell that is greening maybe 5% of their portfolio, but behaving in other developing countries still really bad, flaring. Um, one of the panelists I was with, he was saying, like, in my country, um, Shell is really just flaring gas out and, and, and then they look green, you know? So uh, we've seen it with BP, we've seen it with other, other companies. So them being here is not, you know, a free pass for them not to be pushed and pressured by regulatory uh, measures and the population. But the, the opportunities is of course to really show investors that this is the future. This is where the money is going. Um, I, one of our institutional investors, he's, he looked at the NDCs, which are the pledges from the countries, and said, I see this as an investment program. So if you, we can actually align countries who never had a 2030 economic plan, if once they had a climate plan, you turn that into an economic development plan where climate and growth goes hand in hand because those the new jobs are in the green sector. Right now, wind and solar is cheaper, like I said, than running an existing coal-fired power plant. So the market is starting to really favor the right things. If, we've, if we remove sub subsidies for fossil fuels, it's lost. They lost. Uh, and so being more efficient makes you more competitive. There are so many ways you know, for business to lead in this, and they will be left behind. Those who are investing right now in fossil fuel smelting plants, they will be stuck with the last dark technology. You know, uh, Countries investing now in combustion engine production, you will be stuck with locked in investments. And that is a clear signal when the CEOs are here. Robin? Two thoughts on this. The, the first is, I mean, notwithstanding the, the risks of greenwashing um, and just to focus on the opportunities, one, the business lobby is so powerful and the fact that so many CEOs are publicly putting their, their names behind tackling climate change might, makes it much harder for them then to go and lobby in the other direction. They look much more hypocritical. So I think that that is a, a, a big um, positive. And also, we have a lot of right-leaning governments in power at the moment. For those governments, it's often much easier to make decisions if they look pro-business. Mm. So now you can act on climate and look pro-business because business is really at the table, which is a big positive. 
Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you for your time and thank you, uh, uh, and thank you for your service and, and all of the uh, incredible architecting that you've done. I uh, hope uh, lots of other finance and, and climate ministers follow in your footsteps. Thank you. That was Ida Orkin. I'm now delighted to welcome to the studio His Royal Highness Prince Jaime de Bourbon de Palm, who is climate envoy for the Netherlands. His role is to help raise global ambition and foster international collaboration on climate action. Jaime has an extensive diplomatic career in forging partnerships for innovative solutions to complex global challenges with previous roles including senior advisor on private sector partnerships for the United Nations Refugee Agency. Jaime, welcome to the Condé Studio. No, it's great to be here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an incredibly poignant moment for you to be joining us. We are in the 11th hour of a momentous COP, delayed for a, an extra year, gathered together to try and figure out. And you have had a seat at the table, watched the negotiations, representing a government that has a very important role to play globally and in Europe and in the transatlantic discussion. So give us a little bit of your, your scorecard. Where sure. do you think things have gone well? Where are you hesitant and a bit disappointed? No, there's two COPs happening at the same time. And so that's uh, something that not people are aware, but that's a formal COP who does do the negotiation amongst countries. And there we need to you know, really ramp up our ambition on, on mitigation uh, to avoid more CO2 to, uh, equivalents to come into the, to, into the atmosphere. And we've got the adaptation bit, so how do we adapt to already uh, the, the effects of climate change happening? And then we have climate finance and the rule book, which is boring for you, but to say, how do we report on all the progress going forward? So, um, so I hope on the, la the latter we make good, good steps. On adaptation, uh, financing, it's a big issue. We have $100 billion we promised to, uh, to, in a way, compensate for the effects that climate has towards the global south. Um, the Global South, many countries didn't contribute to the problem, but do have to deal with the effects of it. And we didn't reach the $100 billion. So they say, we had a deal in Paris, and you're not living up to your deal. So they're totally right. We're getting much closer, and we are looking for what's the roadmap forward to actually reach the, reach the, the $100 billion per year to, to, to compensate for, for, for the damage it's done. But it's, um, but it's not just that. I mean, if, if you just look at the finance, well, we could talk about finance in a bit, but then the first thing on mitigation, we're definitely not there. And that's when I said there are two COPs. The formal negotiations, the national plans uh, are definitely not, a, not up to par. We, we, we're not reaching the right, right level. So we started here in Glasgow with, with a negative. Uh, and, you know, is this a failed COP? Where are we going? And then there's the other COP, and that's the ambition COP. That's kind of a big ferry, so all the booths everywhere, and people coming with a methane pledge, and 100 countries signing up, or powering past coal, um, you know, not financing coal abroad people signing up, or you see a forest pledge, we don't need to cut trees, you know. So you have all these pledges, and if you add that ambition, then nobody can be a spoiler, because while certain countries might not want the negotiations to go fast, because of oil interest or, or coal interest, uh, other countries um, in the ambition side of the COP can move ahead and the spoilers don't have to join. And you see a lot of steps being made. So the formal negotiations are, are, are you know, are fully uh, accountable. But the informal that has so much drive are less, less accountable, so they need each other. So let's, let's stick for a moment on the second COP, where yep. nobody can be a spoiler and where all these different announcements have been made, because I think that's probably the grounds for greater optimism. Yep. We can come back to the first one because we must, but what are the big bright spots in, in, in the second COP that you think uh, will stand the test of time and we'll look back on and go, those were remarkable? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I mentioned them a little bit as well, but the, the trees, I mean, we have to, we have to protect nature um, yeah. because that's the best carbon sink, and that's the best uh, solution. Um, but the, the, the methane is interesting as well. Uh, methane has 85% more impact on, on climate than, than, than CO2. And that, if we tackle methane, which is, you know, the creaking oil and gas pipes that, that leak methane, it's the agricultural industry, but it's also, what I didn't know before, the, the paddy fields of rice. And when you leave it in the water, it starts rotting and it emits a lot of methane. If you let the water out, out of season, then actually you don't have it. So they're very easy solutions to do and you can have a, a quite a massive impact on, on climate and it gives us a bit of more window to deal with the other uh, greenhouse gases. Robin, you spent a ton of time trying to get political uh, um, civil servants to share information and it seems that the second COP 
is an area where people can collaborate, learn from each other, chase each other's ambitions, and agree quite quickly on, on stuff. Um, are there other examples that the climate movement can learn from where uh, clusters of civil servants have gathered together to improve each other's decision making and, and, uh, and make progress more effectively than they would if they're all just sitting in their, in their national capitals acting alone? We've definitely seen some examples of passionate communities of civil servants around issues like gender, a lot of sharing there, um, and a lot of fungible lessons in gender equality between countries. We were talking earlier about the diff difficulty in sharing them, but in gender, they're often very shareable. Similarly, in um, indigenous rights, a lot of sharing between communities in Canada and Australia, we've seen examples of that. So I think there's, there's plenty to learn from. And just in general, and we've talked about this before, but I think one of the most interesting precedents for the, um, what's happening on climate and the, the relationship between government and voters is the change in gay rights and the sentiment on gay rights. We saw how quickly that happened after years and years of resistance. And I think something similar is happening in climate. You've now got 64% of people globally who think climate change is a global emergency. And you're seeing examples of public servants working on climate using that now as a, as a tailwind. And I think there'll be lots of learnings around that um, voter, politician, government uh, intersection. So there's a big announcement, which is in the second COP, that we haven't spoken about yet, which is the G funds con uh, commitment, 130 trillion. Mark Carney, uh, Michael Bloomberg mm -hmm. will preside over these set of declarations. Um, now, on one level, that makes the 100 billion transferred every year from developed nations to developing nations to deal with the consequences of climate change smell, seem like small beer. It also is good news because if that money is truly deployed, it is actually enough to finance the transition if we do it with enough to urgency and, and focus. I think the question is, and this is a question for both of you, Jaime first, how will we, how will we know that this is really being done? That it isn't just a, a, a piece of kind of co corporate smooth talk? Because if it's sincere, it's radical. If it's uh, smooth talk, it can actually set us back because it can give people a smokescreen to say they're doing things they're not really doing. So Mark Carney did an amazing job in, in, in really mapping, in a way, all the money that's out there rallying around it to, to get it done. And indeed, it, it dwarfs the $100 billion that we, we need to do. But I don't think he deserves the Nobel Peace Prize for it yet because if it's not tracked to real impact, then, uh, then you know, it is uh, you know, a bucket of... You know, a big pocket of air. And uh, so we, we had a discussion amongst the CEOs and I was invited in it. And, uh, and we kind of all agreed that accountants are going to save the world. Uh, we do need clear accountable standards uh, and we need to be able to track all those funds and to make sure that these reach the most vulnerable communities. And I was speaking to someone in Samoa, a young, a young uh, climate uh, activist, and he said, uh, you know, where's the money? I said, you're right. If only 0.2% uh, re reaches the Pacific Islands, all the hundred billion dollars already, how are they going to ever attract uh, the trillions of dollars or whatever money they need or just the bare minimum they need to be able to adapt? And that, that's the travesty. Um, you see that the systems are not lined up yet to make it happen. The countries don't know how to write clear business proposals, uh, country proposals. Uh, they don't know how to apply for these things and that's why we need this interaction between civil servants to exchange uh, information and knowledge to be able to for them to access all these. And only once we see that access happening, then we can actually say something real is happening. We have to have understanding for accountability in the first place. And we, um, we uh, ran a, a quiz to test public servants' understanding of net zero. It was really interesting because a third of people thought the current NDCs were sufficient to keep us below 1.5 degrees warming. A third of people working in government. So. That knowledge gap needs to be closed for one thing. And then you need to equip people in government uh, to, to work with the private sector and understand the path to net zero. Sustainable finance is one of the biggest skills bottlenecks in government. 
often now, even when there's money and there's political will, there just isn't the capacity and capability around that. And similarly around net zero. So we, we did a partnership with um, the Smith School at Oxford University on sustainable finance training for policymakers. That's now, course, the course we created has been used in 60 different countries. And we're doing, we announced today a partnership with Oxford Net Zero and the Smith School on net zero for public servants. Mm -hmm. And we have an ambition to train 50,000 public servants and 10 of the top 20 emitters by 2025. Because if you do not upskill and close that gap in government, none of this is going to work. It's the glue. So knowledge is one thing and also the type of finance is important, uh, Paul. Um, it's, um, we now are talking about mitigation funds and we need more adaptation funds. And if you are uh, Malawi and you're building a dam, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to have a return of investment. So it needs to be a grant. Because otherwise you indebt yourself just to protect yourself. If you build um, a solar farm, you can actually have a return of investment. And so you can have loads. And so we need a good mix of, of grant money, uh, adaptation money, grant money and, uh, and investment. So, the trillions of dollars that are there of the investors' world, and that's just for mitigation. But the real poor countries are asking adaptation support, hmm. and that's grants. So I have, an, I have another question which has emerged from the, the language of climate negotiations. It's been prominent at COP, and I think has the potential to quite radically change corporate behavior, and that is this magical term of scope three. Mm -hmm. You don't just look at your own emissions, you look down the supply chain yes. to uh, the emissions of the end users of your product. Now, I'll tell you two conversations that I've had with people at COP, and I'd love your reflections on, in your respective worlds, what the consequences will be. A major consulting firm, one of the largest in the world, and a major financial services industry, mm -hmm. um, uh, a company in the financial services industry. One of them is trying to think about the scope three emissions of the global sporting events that they're the major sponsor of and whether they can continue to sponsor that event if that is a high carbon emitting event and whether they should be gathering all the other sponsors who sponsor that sporting event and say unless they change their carbon footprint we can no longer do that that is what scope three means mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. the large global accounting firm says we can look at our own travel of our own consultants. We can look at our BREEAM office use, gold standard or platinum standard. But should we be taking into account the carbon footprint of our clients? And every year say, when we're advising those clients how to be better corporate citizens, how to grow their businesses, if their emissions are growing, are we perhaps responsible for that? Mm. Now, this is not technically what in scope three, right? But both of them have expanded their horizon of economic and moral responsibility for climate based on this rather amorphous concept. And I wonder in both if you're seeing, because you're in this every day of your life, Jaime, and Robin, you watch this with civil servants, whether the new language of accountability and climate is going to start provoking these unintended consequences which change the way people see their own responsibilities. Wow. Um, yes and no. I mean, I think I think um, a lot of corporates are now waiting in governments to, to, to develop all the standards. So uh, a good place for that is OECD. Um, they, they can do that. Um, but there's many other ways. And I, I really think, you know, if governments move too slow on standards, why doesn't the private sector actually get together and develop their own standards and present it to governments to say this, this is this is fine. And um, you know, and, and, and there, there I would put the challenge. Uh, the other one is just on action. So one thing is you can also just account for yourself and, and do it. There is, there's so much out there. Um, the, the, all the supply chains from, from, from you know, deforestation for soy, we've done it in the Netherlands. We realized if we, we all the soy used in the Netherlands is reforestation free, but that's not good enough. So we had to look, well, not just at responsible sourcing there, but we had to look at the whole ecosystem there and make the whole forest. Um, uh, source uh, responsibly and then we saw a little bit of change so a lot of people are thinking about how to make the supply chain work and the private sector is, is key and they're in all the parts of the supply chain those closest uh, consumers uh, facing are more aware uh, those further away supply chain are less and therefore it's good to have this scope three because then you see that the ones at the end of the, uh, of the supply chain who are more aware are pushing those uh, down the supply chain to do more now my call is also for the clean energy transition 
we need for the clean energy transition more metals and minerals. So we're get, going to get less oil and gas out of the ground, and we're going to mine more. So how do we do it that we don't take, uh, we, make, we don't displace the problem, one problem for the next? So more wind park and solar and more mining. And so we need to make sure that we do that in a, in a safe and a fair way. So actually a call to all the energy, clean energy companies that are doing so great also to feel responsible for scope three and actually say, where do the wind uh, turbines come from? Where do the solar, wind, where do the electric cars come from, the metals and minerals? And how do we make sure that these are sourced in a good way? And that dialogue is still not happening because they feel good about themselves. And I think the whole business change, also those in the forefront of climate, should think about scope three. Robin? Just an aside, but it's really good to see a lot of venture capital now going into supply chain tech. I saw an article the other day saying it's the next fintech and it's a massive overlooked um, part of the economy, which is right. But if I were to be able to pay for something to be done in government that government doesn't pay for, it would be to hire a crack communications team to take government procurement mm. and make people pay attention. It is the most important unsexy thing you've ever heard of. It is $13 trillion a year spent by government on buying stuff. Almost all of it is opaquely spent. And there's an argument that the, the SDGs, climate amongst them, do not get funded unless we repurpose that procurement budget. And no one talks about it and no one pays attention. Well, I led a panel specifically on that, and, um, and it was the sexiest panel in the whole cup, <laughs> um, I must say. And, and uh, no, we had quite a few uh, from leading countries. No, but it, it is in the, in the early stage. But there's so much, what you say, purchasing power of government but also of the UN system. So it also had UNDP, UNEP, uh, UNFCCC, yeah. uh, 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 well, and many other agencies, UNHCR. They're all buying a lot, of, a lot of products around the world to do their work, and they're not looking at scope three. So that's a very quick win. And it's a great example of something where if, you, if a few countries do it well, you get that domino effect, yeah. because it's, it's an easy win. It allows politicians to stand up and say, at no real cost, look at this amazing, you know, we've redirected all this money, which we were already spending. We'll give you a link to put on, on your website of Initiative of Green Government, and then other governments, uh, or whomever is civil service looking here, you can, uh, they can try to yeah. convince their governments to join. So, so getting, when you buy your desks and your blackboards and your chalk and your lights for your schools, to say, here is my green procurement policies, we're only going to buy products from suppliers who conform with A, B, C, and D, and that's yeah. not just scope one, but it's one, two, and three, and getting the procurement offices and all of the ministries at a national level, but all the way down to your local, you know, mayoral or town councils or provinces, that's a big deal to get that through. Now, a government that's as organized as the Netherlands, I'm sure that's not a small job as you, for no. you guys, but, you know, for governments that are still standing up their civil servants and uh, that must be really hard. How, how, how do you do it, Robin? Well, I think part of it is, is bottom up. You can't do everything top down. So you have to empower and equip people who are in these mid-level roles who ha often have a lot of discretion and often they, they can make things happen. And one of the things we obsessed with at Apolitical is how you know top civil servants, top politicians get access to the best knowledge, the best skills, the fancy conferences. It is the people in the middle who have the power to either make things happen or stall progress. And we want to democratize access to knowledge and learning for those people because they can, they can shift procurement budgets. Okay, in our show notes, we'll make reference to everything that the, that the government of the Netherlands are doing and anything else that you can point us to, Robin. Um, I promise I was gonna come back to the slightly, I suspect, harder conversation about the real cop. Yeah. Um, and. And, and what we're going to get out of it. And I know that the, the ink is not dry and therefore I'm not gonna ask you to crystal ball, yeah. but where do you think there's real cause for optimism? Like what is going to be good in this, in this COP? And then where from the perspective of the government of the Netherlands do you feel as though we, we could have and should have done better? No, I mean, and eventually the COP is a means to an end, so we need to see what the, what the you know, the national measures are globally and measure them well with all these initiatives that we had also in the second COP, or the parallel COP, to, uh, to, to reach our agreement. So that, I would say there's nothing else, that's the most important bit um, on mitigation. What I, uh, what I see in this COP, how the process is working, is actually hopeful, 
We have two years squashed in one. This year we, we, had, to, we had to postpone because of Corona uh, vi uh, virus. We had to postpone it for a year. But, um, and, and right now, in the first week, we thought it would be a disaster. But actually, people decided from, say, nine options to two options. And there were all these different topics were, were, were sifted down to, to the bare minimum. So now we have a very clear understanding of what's on the table. And so the first week is all technical. This week becomes political. So you see politicians flying in, ministers flying in. The, the UK has decided which ministers from the north and south should be co-deciding on leading all the different flows. And right now we noticed a bit of a dip because everybody's waiting who's moving first and we don't want to give in something which we, you know, uh, which we then will lose if others move moves faster. And it supposedly is with every cup. And then there's this huge hill which will come in the next two days when they suddenly have to decide all these things. And uh, so we, we can't really say, but what's really positive today was that the Chinese and the Americans came on the news and said, you know, okay, gave a joint statement. So they started the COP fighting and they reconciled. And they already had a text. Hopefully some of the text will be part of the end statement. Uh, and that kind of gives the base. Um, that they already agree. And then you see that a lot of, you know, they kind of represent the North and the South. And then we can negotiate from there upwards. So that gives us already the first step on that hill of, of agreements that we need to make. The phasing out of fossil fuels in general and fossil fuel subsidies, or how confident are you that this is going to stay or stick? You no, know, what's really, really cool is that you get a COP, so everybody suddenly focuses on, on climate, and there's many issues in many countries, but suddenly this becomes the issue and the news. Uh, we came in with many other pledges, but for instance, the Netherlands was still financing fossil fuels abroad, or giving guarantees for, um, you know, uh, for, 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 for investments abroad. Um, we decided this Monday, that that was going to stop and it came as a shock because it was the pressure in the cup that was pushing us to move further and activists in the Netherlands and here uh, in Glasgow that, that told us to do so. Then we thought we were a bit late in the game because many other countries already did so but the day after Germany went through because they had said until then well Germany and France, or sorry Netherlands and France hadn't moved, now the Netherlands had moved and that pushed them into a deep political debate that made them move. Spain, I spoke to them and said listen now Germany and the Netherlands moved, why doesn't Spain move? So, oh, it will take us half a year. But also there the momentum pushed them and they went through as well and they're not going to finance fossil fuels abroad anymore. Now we're talking to Germany and France, uh, sorry, Belgium and France as, as next one. So it really is a domino and these things are really encouraging during this cup. That's an astonishing case of just European cooperation and momentum building and, and after a while if you get enough momentum people feel that they've been left behind and they're the laggards. Exactly. So somebody exactly. has to go first yeah. and then you're, you're the laggard. Yeah. So the first they felt safe in numbers and then the numbers go against them and they feel standing alone and they feel they have to move as well. Let's hope the investment banks follow your lead now. Well, we have the, the biggest pension fund in the Netherlands. It's the fifth biggest in the world. I uh, decided not only to go past coal, but past uh, any fossil fuel. And that's uh, $500 billion in, uh, in, uh, in investments that will not go into fossil anymore. So these things are happening. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of momentum. And that, you know, that's really new that you see the private sector really gearing up um, and, and making a stand. So tell us something that gives us a little bit of the human feeling. I mean, you've been in a negotiating, you're, you're representing a government, your job outside of COPS is to do this day in and day out. So you've been rubbing shoulders with diplomats that you don't always see, and you've also been in the hurly-burly without betraying any official secrets or confidences. No. Tell us some stories from the negotiating room that are, uh, that are interesting. Well, I, th I think this, this, this thing of the export credits was one of them. So I go to the German climate envoy and say, come on. And this is a formal request of the Netherlands. So, and then he has a pressure point to his government. Because, for instance, for me, I can't decide. It's the ministers that have to decide the position. But if I tell the Dutch ministers, and same I did with the, with, with the Germans, that five countries have asked me formally to, to do this, and then I feel the pressure of the external world towards the Netherlands and everybody's looking, that's an extra argument for a minister to move. So th that's what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm using external pressure to convince my government to, to move forward. But what really gives me hope, actually, um, you know, we keep forgetting, we, we see the, all these negotiations and things happening. We talk to, to, you know, tech created this problem. I mean, all the cars and all the pollution that we have. We try to tech our way out, and it's definitely possible. We can do a lot. But we should not forget it's eventually nature that, that, is, that is there, and that is our base. And I smell the trees around uh, this event here, and, uh, and you get total rest, and you say, you know, the best thing we can do, and this is the first cup that, that, that nature was present as a topic, 
uh, the best thing we can do is Mother Nature, the regenerative part of nature to give that its space to, to do its work. And that's the best carbon sink in the world. I mean, I spoke to, 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 to Benioff, uh, head of Salesforce, uh, he's a big techie, but he himself said as well that the best tech out there is, uh, is biotech and the best biotech is, uh, are, are the plants and the trees in the world. So we should give that part of nature its space and that gives me actually a lot of confidence. A note of optimism. And, uh, and, 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 I, I can give you one. Please. Uh, we have just found that over 80% of the people working in government, the hundreds of millions of people working in government uh, globally, think that their governments aren't doing enough on climate change. So there is pressure coming from all directions now. You, you've just up, mentioned a few. Right. Bottom up, sideways, cross sectors, and uh, I think that's going to lead to exponential change. I've, I've worked for five ministries in the Netherlands, so I'm the only roving civil servant. Every ministry wants to work with me. So I've, I thought it would be a huge infight between, you know, about territory. You often see that with, with organizations. And this has the opposite. I mean, everybody wants to work together and they connect on every level with each other to, to find solutions. So there's a huge drive yeah. and a willingness to do things. And so solutions are being presented to the political leaders what can be done. I'm going to ask a final question to both of you. We have interviewed many, many youth activists over the course of the last 10 days. And I have been struck that the series of youth activists that we've spoken to, I spoke to a guy today, 19 years old, in the Biden White House Climate Action uh, uh, Task Force. Wow. He speaks with a level of leadership and articulacy that you just, you don't get in, in 40 year olds. Uh, I spoke two days before that, a young uh, climate activist in a wheelchair, elected in South Harlem as an elected representative, a more articulate, vocal, smart, passionate person I haven't met in a long time. They remind me of the young anti-apartheid activists mm. 30 years ago who were old before their time because they had to take to the streets. Um, and they give me hope. But I wonder, from the perspective of civil servants and from the perspective of a person who has represented government, and, and you're predisposed, I know your track record, and I know who you are, but are these people breaking through? Are they capturing our attention? On, and are they changing our decision making? And, and, and are, do we have a lot to thank them for, for the changes that trickle up, like the example that you just gave, which was a rather technical thing, yeah. but it came from somewhere else. And is that where it's coming from? I mean, first, the intergenerational perspective is, is, is super useful, and uh, the voice is, is becoming louder and louder, and it's not from the outside anymore. So we have, I've seen so many youth um, representatives uh, at the COP, and it's not just youth. I mean, they really represent a constituency. Uh, they have a following. Uh, and they really know their topics. So they're part of it. We've incorporated them in our, in our negotiation team. So they are actually with our meetings every morning. Uh, they, come, can, they have a pass. They can go in and out of, uh, of, of, of the meetings whenever they want to. Um, and, and they give the independent voice also towards the press. Um, so they, it's totally transparent uh, from our point of view. And we've paid also for others from other countries that cannot be there to have access to the COP. I just saw a, um, a gentleman from, from Bangladesh said, listen, they just signed a declaration that would include um, um, youth, but they haven't put anybody in the delegation. But look here, it says the Netherlands, um, you gave us a, a blue pass so we can enter the, can enter the COP. So it, it, that, 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 that access is, is incredibly important and, and stimulating. And they just know there are things. It's just really refreshing to have someone from a different background in, as part of your delegation. But it's not that it's the youth. I would say the oldies are doing pretty well. I mean. Biden, Kerry, the Pope, um, and many others are, are, are going out of, you know, uh, you know, really out there. So I see all generations really stepping up and it's not on the youth to resolve it. People putting it on their shoulders, I think it's unfair. I see all generations really stepping up and doing it and they have, a, have their role to play as well, the youth. Robin? Well, I think sometimes it happens at a very human level. I've spoken to so many public servants who've said, you know, my kids wanted me to go on the climate march with them. So it's coming from, you know, the kitchen table at one mm -hmm. level. 
And then I think it's coming through, not enough, but it's very promising. One of the most exciting movements in government is around citizen engagement and innovative ways of, of doing that. These you know, citizen assemblies, which take random assortments of the public and incorporate their voices. The UK did one on climate, which had some really interesting findings. Not enough youth in them yet, but those are really powerful. Participatory budgeting, where people choose how budgets are spent. We need much, much more. And in a world where we don't yet have the youth able to vote, which is another discussion, which I think needs to be had, but these mechanisms for getting closer and listening and making sure that listening doesn't have the effect of excluding people further. That's, it's, a, it's a delicate needle to thread, but it can be done. A lot of hope there. Yeah, and I'm a personal fan of this because I think a government that, uh, that gives trust will get trust and, uh, and there's a huge trust deficit. So I think these, these measures totally make sense. My government is totally not ready for it yet, but, uh, but I hope that we'll introduce it. There's evidence on that too. Um, governments that run participatory budgeting, which is now in thousands of locations, it results in higher trust, even in the most low trust excluded population. And if you look at the cost, the the cost in terms of populism, of the trust deficit, that, that's reason alone to do it. Yeah. And the absence of tr trust translates into crime, disaffection, a whole set of social uh, yeah. you know, ills and norms. So, I mean, I think to end on a note of trust, our job is to restore trust between governments and citizens and also that our generation will do the right thing by not just the youth, but by future generations as well. And uh, I guess that's why we're all here at COP. So, um. and, and to just to wrap up on my side, I think the COP, we won't reach the goals that we wanted to, or we need to, but we've reached more than we thought we would. Hmm. And so that's my optimism here. And hopefully we have a step approach forward that we keep the ambition pushing. And that's why the youth and everybody else watching out there, uh, please keep on pushing us because we need that push to be able to go further. Fantastic note on which to end. So thank you for listening to this episode produced in partnership with DLA Piper. Feel free to subscribe, rate and review. The podcast is available on all major podcast platforms on the Conduit Conversations channel. For more information on the Conduit and our community of change makers, please visit theconduit.com. DLA Piper is committed to making business better by helping clients and communities transition to and thrive in a more sustainable future. To find out more, please visit dlapiper.com. SESG.